Howdy, howdy, ho. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, to begin off here, we have a little question to ponder. So, does anyone have any ideas what's the difference between these two little flowers right here? Just kind of like general thing. It's not like this is exactly this RGB color or something like that. You know, we just want generals. <laughs> anyone? Throw something out there? The I don't bite. The shapes are different. Shapes are different, right? So, you know, this flower kind of opens up here, right? This flower bud is kind of compact and stuff, right? So, yeah, different shape. Anyone else? Color. Color, right? Both of them are very nice, nice tint of yellow, right? <laughs> yeah. So this one right here is going to be, you know, a red, red rose. This one's a lotus, has nice little pink and whiteness to it, so we got color there. Yes? I'd say the background. The background, all right, I like that. So I see this one right here, it's kind of like in this pond, right? See all the lily pads and all that? This one's obviously on land, so different environments. Does anyone else have something to go for? Yay, nay, maybe? Mm. Thorns and no thorns. Yeah, thorns, no thorns, right? Well, hopefully look, this lotus doesn't have thorns. They don't come with thorns usually, so. Yeah, roses are gonna be very thorny, right? You have to like pick them off, we hand them off to your girlfriend or she's gonna be mad, right? Yeah, don't know what you should be. Oh, she might be happy too, but if she gets stabbed by the flower, she might not be that happy, so. Gotta watch out for that. There's, there's some obvious differences, right, between these two flowers. So if we want to make some type of model, where we're like, okay, we want to know what makes this flower more different in a more mathematical sense, do you guys think we can possibly do that? Sounds something feasible, right? Yeah. Woo! So, today we're going to be talking about traditional models and techniques. <coughs> so, basically, um, from the turn of the 1900s up until neural networks kind of exploded, 99% of the models out there, it's kind of like an amalgamation of these different techniques, and we're going to learn three of them today. Um, but even though they're not neural networks, they're still kind of important. They're extremely easy to work with. You guys see that later on when we go into the notebook. And it's something you guys should still look into, even though it's probably not something that we're doing a lot of research stuff on nowadays, but still very important stuff to look into. So going on to our little, little thing about the data set here, we, Sir Roland Fisher, this lovely man right here, he had a problem. Okay, and this was in the year 1936, I believe. He had a bunch of flowers, right? And this was before genetics, so he can just sequence the genes and say, all right, this is what makes this flower this flower, right? He had to find a systematic way of classifying flowers. <coughs> so what do you think you would want to do with that? Anyone? What type of systematic numbery way could we classify flowers with? A decision tree. Decision tree? Okay. Seems like you've seen this before. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Let's see how similar one flower is to another. Okay. So when you say similar, what type of feature are we going to be looking at? <coughs> Different measurements on the flower. Okay. Like height or weight. Height or weight or, you know. Okay, so maybe we can weigh the flowers and like, this flower is more heavy than this flower, so this flower is this because it's heavier. Just stuff like that, right? And we measure length, so maybe the length of the stem. Maybe roses tend to be longer than lotuses, so something we can do. Roland, he, he wanted to use measurements to base his predictions, right? <coughs> To do that, he got some measurements from a group of flowers, and he was looking for the pattern in data that he could use to help um, maximize the separation between flowers. All right, when we say maximize it, we're trying to find the thing that makes it uh, different and unique, right? So, hang on. <coughs> All right, there we go. So these are the three flowers we're looking at here. We have the Isis Pitosa, 
Iris versicolor and Isis virginica. Now, <coughs> right quick. Does anyone see, uh, oh dear. Does anyone see um, what flower looks less than the other flowers? <coughs> they all look yellow. Yeah, they really do look yellow. <coughs> really not for Asian there. But I heard Satosa here, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, and that, that makes sense, right? Just look at them. So, do you think that because it looks... <coughs> Sorry about that. Because this one looks different from all these, that this one's going to be easy to classify? Yeah, probably, right? So that's something we're going to look into. Now, that being said, we know this one's probably the most unique flower. Do you think because these two look very similar, we're going to have a hard time distinguishing between them? No? Yes, maybe? Possibly. Possibly. Let's get, let's get a show of hands. No. Yes? Okay, we got a lot more yes than no, so yeah. So, this is what our data set looks like. So we have sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Simple little measurements, right? We're using centimeters here. So, when we plot all this out, does anyone see any pattern from our uh, predictions last time? <coughs> anyone? Just so you guys see it, the red is Satosa, green is Viscola, and blue is Virginica. Yes? So Yep. <coughs> yep, we can definitely see that here, right? <coughs> Ooh, sorry. So, the Satosa, very unique, right? We can see that there's obviously a lot of difference between this and the two here. Does anyone see anything about the Vesicella and Virginica? They overlap. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. There is a lot of overlap between the two. And we're going to say later that these two are very hard to kind of split apart in a systematic way. We can still do it, but there's, there is going to be a gray zone, right? So the first thing we're going to look at is something called Canis neighbor. And that is our little neighbor here, Mr. Ned Flanders, right? Howdy ho. So with Canis neighbor, what we're trying to do is we are trying to combine things that are like based off of distance from other things we've seen, right? So we have, so here, here's, here's a way to think about that. In The Simpsons, uh, Homer Simpson and Ned Flanders are more alike than Homer Simpson and uh, Mr. Burns, right? Would you say that? So Homer, and Ned live very close together. They're both kind of middle class, you know. And Burns off in the country there in his big estate. He's very dip, very different from everyone else in the in Springfield, right? Yeah. So we can see that, right? Kind of like visually. And if you look around your neighborhood, you probably live by people kind of similar to yourself. Like you all live in student housing or something like that. So you're all around neighbors that are also students, right? Maybe, you know. So we see stuff like that, right? So, we're going to make predictions based off of what the neighbors are like. And we're going to use distance as kind of like determining who is the nearest neighbor. And when I say distance, I mean like the measurement. So, if this is closer, so if this is 5 inches and this is uh, 6 inches away, like of length or something, we can say they're pretty close neighbors. So, kind of get an example here. We have this mystery item here, right? So we're going to look at its neighbors and we're going to determine whether or not it should be a, well, I was going to say like white star, but it's kind of yellow. So we're going to say yellow star. Um, on the recording there, these are white. So, but basically the four pointed stars or the five pointed stars, right? 
So let's get a show of hands. Who thinks that it should be a four-point star? Who thinks it should be a five-point star? What are we basing it on? We're basing it off the neighbors. Oh. So the things that it's close by to. Right? So let's see if Payne's neighbor says that it's going to be five pointed or three point or four pointed. Okay, so when we look at just the three nearest neighbors, we got two four pointed and one five pointed. So based on that, what should this be? Four pointed. Four -pointed. Okay, maybe, maybe some of us are wrong, right? This is supposed to be a four pointed star. But what should happen if we look at two additional neighbors? Anyone? It'll be a five point star, right? Look at that. So when we look at two additional neighbors, suddenly the classification changes. This is something you need to look at when you're doing KNS neighbor. The number of surrounding things to look at is going to change the classification. So you need to find the one that looks best. And this could be one of the trickiest things to do with KNS neighbor. The next one we're going to be looking at is support vector machines. So support vector machines, the basic idea behind that is that we have this line that in reality is called a hyperplane. And the hyperplane, you take the dimension of your data, minus one, and you get the dimension of the hyperplane. And this is the barrier that we're going to be using to separate the two items, right? And based off this barrier, this side here is going to be these colors. And this side over here is going to be these colors. I don't want to say exactly which one it's because like, this one's like half blue because of the projector right now. But let's imagine the different colors, not just like some yellow tint, right? So that's how we do it. Now, there are different ways we can draw this line, right? So there's three main kernels. And the kernel is kind of what we use to draw this. We have linear. So linear, line. Fair enough, right? Does anyone see a problem with this linear kernel? <coughs> right, this one right here, maybe? Yeah. yeah. So with the linear kernel, we do have a point, right, that is misclassified. That's a problem, right? Misclassification is not good. So what if we curve the line? What happens now? We don't got, yeah, we got it now. Look at that. So that's going to be our polynomial kernel. And using the polynomial kernel, we get slightly better results. So there you go. And kind of what's considered the best is something called the radial bias function. Basically, what that does is that it tries to create a region around each of the points. And that region around it is considered in and the region outside of it is considered out. It's considered one of the better ones, because you do get this nice little blobby function here. You do get kind of something like this, too, over in a uh, polynomial. But you do see how these, these here and these here are very close to the line. And then in radial bias function, they're kind of nice group, nicely grouped together. So it's nice, it's nice to kind of use radial bias function. And if you ever do SVNs, and the real world, the best, your best cases go with RBF. So, random forest. So this was from the original paper, written about random forest. So significant improvement in classification accuracy have resulted from growing an ensemble. Does anyone know what that means? A group. So the Wikipedia definition of that is a group of things that act as a whole. So you haven't heard of an ensemble of violins or something? They all play together as like if they're one. That's where it comes from. A bunch of different trees working together and letting them vote for the most popular class. That's all that's going on here. To kind of show you what this all means, I'm going to break this down into a few steps. The first step we're going to look at is the tree. So. How, how do you guys get to class? Car? Car? Does anyone ride the bike? Woo, we got a few. 
Okay. Does anyone take the bus? Maybe. Does anyone ride a motorcycle? Maybe. Oh, just me? Okay. So we're going to try to see if we can determine how you get to class based off of just a few questions. So the first, how far away do you live? Right? So do you live more than five kilometers away or less than five kilometers away? So who knows what a kilometer is? Ooh, okay. Um, for everyone else, it's a little over three miles. So in that ballpark. So do you live, so would you say less than three miles away, you're pretty close by? Mm -hmm. What? No, five kilometers. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you, you know what I meant. <laughs> Quite a hell, mate. Okay. If that was the case, then five k's would be very rough. Yeah. yeah. But basically, five five k is kind of it's kind of like the in between between far away and close by, right? Yeah. So let's look down on one of these branches, right? So who live who lives less than five kilometers away? Okay, most of y'all. Okay, do you guys live near cl close to the public transportation? Maybe. The UCF buses count too. So, if you live in one of the communities with a UCF bus, you should raise your hand. So, if that's the case, we're going to determine that you take the bus. Who does that? Ah, oh, a few. Okay, we got two. Yeah, everyone else is like, no, I drive my car, and then I live across the street. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I'm watching you. That's why I can't get a freaking parking place here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if you don't live close to transportation, you should ride your bike. Does anyone, well, we know one person rides a bike here. Is that true? I also ride. You also ride your bike. Sometimes. Sometimes when it's not a thousand degrees outside. Exactly. Yeah, same. <laughs> okay, so was that accurate? Maybe, yeah, didn't work for everyone, but generally, right? Let's look over here. So, the people that live more than five miles, five kilometers away, do you guys prefer to drive a car or ride a motorcycle? Anyone? Car, car, car. car. Do you guys drive your car here? <laughs> yeah, you bloody peasants. Yeah. And you know, me over here being a sick motorcycle person, I pop wheelies to school, it's great. Can you actually? No. <laughs> <laughs> my, my bike's 400 cc's. It goes blah, 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 blah. It gets here eventually, but I'm not getting hit by someone. Yeah, it's whatever. But yeah. So, for the people that went through this tree, raise your hand if, you, if it was accurate. And maybe, ra Louis, raise your hand if it wasn't. Okay, because <laughs> a lot of you guys live really close by but still drive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and people still complain about parking at UCF. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. You guys have a bus, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Don't complain about parking ever again. But it's never on time. It's true. Okay, yeah, you know what, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll give you that. W listen, we just need to take those spin scooters and put them outside of all the student housing places, and then it'll be like chaos, but it'll work, right? <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> okay, so why decision trees are awesome? Now, for the people that have taken CS1, what's the runtime for a tree traversal in big O notation? Log n? Big O log n, right? Is that good? Bad? Okay? That's excellent. We miss you. What's the runtime? What's the runtime? What is runtime? How quickly it goes. So in computer terms, big O, if you guys haven't taken CS1 yet, big O log time, big O runtime is just a way that we can mathematically express how quickly a program runs. So the program to run a decision tree is log n, which is great, right? So they, they, they run quickly. And if you guys don't know much about big O, follow that, that's a great little explanation there. And because they run quickly, they can run on anything. So they can run on a car, they can run on my phone, they can run on my computer, they can run on my Raspberry Pi. Even on a Mac. Even on a Mac. Yeah. God forbid. <laughs> God forbid you spent all your tuition money on a Mac. And then the ISO uh, 
240 dies and you can't get a replacement for it and you just have a $3,000 paperweight. Okay, yeah. But you can install Linux on it. You can if you can't charge it. It's very lightweight. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, whatever. Either way. However, there are some problems, right? Now, in our example, um, we had like uh, uh, accuracy, right? Because a lot of you guys live really close by and still drive to campus. Still salty about that. <laughs> um, so it's kind of not very accurate. And we overfitted, thinking that the people that live close by would want to not drive to campus, which is obviously not true. So it's not the best model. Is there any way we can make this decision tree better? More options. More options? So we make it deeper? Mm -hmm. Maybe a probability. Probability? How would we do probability? I don't know. I'm in an OR, and then in decision trees, they can get decisions and then probabilities. So you can go into different things. So it's not like a binary decision, you can go through multiple layers. Is it, is it a possibility? Thank you. Each branch has a probability. Okay. So you kind of transverse the whole tree, but it gives you probability at the bottom instead of like a, like you have to go down this branch or this branch. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Is anyone else? Maybe from the thing we heard earlier? I guess like if maybe have another option under less than five kilometers, so like if you're on campus. Mm -hmm. Or like maybe more granularity for that. Okay, so maybe more questions we can ask. Or like, so maybe maybe not just one, like whether they're less greater than or less than five kilometers away, but maybe like one for uh, like, like maybe like two and a half, mm -hmm. and then five, and you know, maybe more than that. Okay, that's true. Anyone else? I saw some hands over here. Uh, if we're adding more options, I would say like maybe a two four tree would be okay. Uh, if, like we had more options to do, like for each node, we can have like multiple choices. Okay, so we add more options, so we add more clarity. There's one big thing I'm missing here that I haven't heard yet. Does anyone want to say it? More multiple trees. Multiple trees. Hmm. So we have a bunch of trees looking together. Okay, come back here. So that's what we're gonna do, and we're gonna do this thing called bagging. Okay, so we're gonna take multiple trees. And each of these trees, they're going to be overfitted to a small subset of our data. OK? So what this is going to do is that we have a bunch of these little trees, and these contain a little bit of truth to the overall data set. OK? Is anyone following what's going on? So we have a bunch of these trees. OK? And they all, they all have a different idea of what's right. And all these trees come together, and they vote on the decision they want to make, OK? So we have a bunch of these trees, and I think, you know what, sir? I think you drive to campus, right? That's, that's the vote. Was that accurate? Yeah. yeah, OK. And you, sir, bike to campus. Is that accurate? Uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, there you go. So overall, this voting gives us a very powerful model, right? I love democracy. Absolutely beautiful. Vote, vote Palpatine 2020. <laughs> so yeah. So bootstrap, um, that's kind of the term for making, taking a small subset of the data and overfitting the tree to it. It's bootstrap aggregation. If you guys want to look in more of that, follow this link. It's a very interesting method, but if we went into it, you guys would die from mathematics. I don't want to do that to you guys tonight, maybe next time. Um, but you get a very good model from this. And this very good model runs very quickly and is very accurate for the simplicity. So even today, many data scientists use random force because it's so easy and so accurate. So if you guys ever go into industry, you'll be seeing quite a bit of random force. Go throw that out there. So that being said, are there any questions? Yes, no, maybe so. Oh, we're kind of um, so like if these trees are fit to the same, or like overfit to specific parts of the data set, are they all like the same size per se, or are they all? You can differentiate the size, you can make them bigger, you can make them smaller. Mm -hmm. They're just different trees. That's the main thing. Okay. Oh, so that's where I can access the 
Oh, we can access the PowerPoint. Do we want to hand that over to Brandon so I can show you where to get the PowerPoint and the notebook? Yes. I posted the link in Discord, but our website is now functional and up. So we are we so all our core stuff is up. And we are uh, I'll go over that and then Nick's gonna take over here for the uh, for the workshop section. Brilliant. Um, just so you know if you if any of you guys wanna are, are, are going to leave to follow to do the go to our feedback form. Um, remember, we always uh, love hearing your feedback and how we can do better. So uh, you just go to our website, ucfai.org forward slash feedback to bring up that form. All right, so let's bring this up here. Um, all right, let's pull this down. So I'm with website and we'll, we'll be able to pull up the notebook right from there and also get the slides as well. So let me up here. Oh god. <laughs> All right. Don't worry, the recording is good. So the recording will be clear at least. All right. So let me see what I got. Yeah. Okay. So let's make this a bit bigger. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, so we don't need to. So let's go to the website. So go to ucfai.org. Uh, okay. So this is our main page. Um, so we are in the core group. Uh, so we're just going to go to core here. Um, so we're in uh, spring 2020. Uh, so this is kind of um, this holds. You can see all of our past content, and then spring 2020. This is our current content. Um, so it has like all the information, and then this, uh, and then as our lectures, as we go out throughout the week in our in our workshops and slides and everything's all put up, they'll be populated here, so you can come here and have it all you know nice and neat to grab it. So if you go, so you see you can see regressions from last week. So it also has a YouTube link, the slides, and the notebook, and you can pull the notebook up either on GitHub, Kaggle, or Colab. So Colab is kind of like Kaggle, where you can run uh, notebooks online. It's just through Google, uh, Google's Colab. Um, so you can use that too, but you won't have the data or anything. So Kaggle is the recommended one. That's what we support. Um, but yeah, so here you can look at the slides and, um, and also view the notebook. So we're just going to click follow along on Kaggle right here. And it shall link us right to the notebook. Anybody, everybody good to pull that up? Who who doesn't have it up? Uh, yeah. yeah. So you go to ucfai.org. Go to core, and then go to spring 2020 edition. That's our one we're on now, and then right there. Yep. Follow along on Kaggle. Are you fine with viewing it through this? That's just kind of how I've been. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could try. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I gotta oh, sign into Google. Hang on a sec. Very good. Ah, okay, let me pull this over. All right, so I'm just I gotta sign into Google real quick because Kaggle does not. Is anyone else having problems getting the notebook going? All right. I agree. Come on. Okay. All right. So once you have the notebook up here, uh, you're just gonna want to click copy and edit. This will pull a copy to your account, so you can. Uh, uh, click I understand and accept for the data. And, oh my, okay. Sorry, I gotta <laughs> do this real quick. Don't worry, we, we, the, the slides, you know, we're making pretty good on time, so it's okay if we take a, I just gotta put this in. Sorry about that. Do you need a capital account to run the notebook? Yes, you have to. You have to create an account. Yeah, but I think um, you know you can just use a Google account. It's pretty easy. Is everyone on the notebook? Got it. Yeah, you said Google Colab is not recommended. Yeah, use the Kaggle one. Cause that, cause that, it automatically like links in the data and stuff, so you don't have to download data or do anything. It has everything right there to go. Great, because I already I'm not using my. Can oh you my just God. sign into your? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Because I okay, this is just ridiculous. Okay, what was this? Very neat. Right. 
her account was blocked. <laughs> yeah, my, I tried to verify my account, and it just told me my account got deactivated. So. <laughs> yeah. so he's gonna log in on this. So we can get that. Um. Yeah, so how are you guys feeling about it so far for for this for the rainforest and the full recognition of KSA? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I really like this is one of my one of my favorite ones because it's actually you know this the stuff is. is is very simple conceptually, and honestly, the math isn't too bad behind it either. And but these models actually power a lot that I have in your day to day life. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, just so I'm good getting it right, yeah. Um, last class we went over linear regression. Linear logistic regression, yeah. Okay. So, it's just yeah, yeah, they're different, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's a linear, like, regression is kind of the simplest form, but it is machine learning. So, I mean, pretty much everything we do in core for this semester is all machine learning. Um, uh, falls under that umbrella, so yeah. This, uh, this is the, the non-neural network, you know, deep, the non-deep learning uh, thing. Next week, we're actually starting neural networks, so that starts, we'll start doing deep learning and all that stuff. So, like, when do we use these certain techniques um, but that well, that really depends on the data you have. So your these model, you know, you you build your model around your data. You don't build a model, over, you don't just build a model first and then try to put data in there. So you know, I mean, data that you know for linear regression, you know, data that was that had like a, some type of linear relationship where if one increased, the other one increased linearly. You know, linear regression was really good at that. So there was some simple physics stuff. Uh, or an example where, like, depending on, like, using, like, um, like a ball drop over, what was it, like, height or something, and it'll be able to, like, to model a uh, like, linear relationship between them. So it really depends on the type of data you have. So as you can see here, this all the all the models for today, these all deal with categorical data. So categorical data, um, you're trying to classify things into different classes, so or just, like, different types. So, you know, that, that's what all these models specialize in. So if you're trying to, trying to predict, um, is this going to be this class or this class, you know, you, you might use one of these models. Um, and, and, you, and the data isn't that, like, well, you don't have, like, a, a high amount of data. Or not high amount of data, like a large amount of data. That's up to some time. Because you couldn't, his account card. Yeah, it's too much. Or I mean, unless you're trying to do, like, picture data or something. Yeah, yeah. Do you think okay. it's going to be I have two of them. My account's not loading. There's some, data, you know, yeah, I mean, the thing is with machine learning stuff, just be there's a general a guidelines for uh, a lot of things. Thing so really through my I know, I know. It's not going with me. Much all <coughs> being, like, just from testing and seeing how, how it works for a certain type of data. So, yeah. So, like, for like for example, like, doing picture yeah, data, you probably want to use some kind of confidential yeah, neural network, uh, which we'll cover uh, two weeks from now. Um, so keep you working. know, for, for type of tabular data, so tabular meaning kind of data we're working with, like, like spreadsheets of data, you know, doing some of this, like, uh, doing the, like the little regression or the models that we're gonna you know go over today, where like simple neural network models can work well for that kind of data. Good for having two factor. Not a lot of complexity. I mean, there's a lot of complexity. I was on my phone. It's like a table of numbers, and yeah. it's usually not that. Like you don't have like okay. hundred thousand. Okay. Hey, can you like stop? Data points are pushing into the model at once. Stop what? So it's Distracted. Just like smaller models. <laughs> I know. Should um, I just like touch his half rope? I mean, if you're <laughs> like, like, like uh, language processing, that's for current neural networks. Um, so that, um, you can talk about CNN. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, so I mean, it really depends on what type of data you have, and then you build your model to try to, try to oh, work with that data and, and do, make predictions. Oh, there, so there we go. Is it coming up? There's not really a cheat right, cool. per se, but there's general guidelines you can find, but oh. you'll find people that have conflicting things and things like that. But there's, yeah. some, there's some standards that we'll go over, <coughs> things like to try first to see, you know, they kind of give you like a baseline to work with. Oh, that is that. so weird. All right. So, yeah. Um, so what can I okay? So we're good on the notebook. Yeah. We should. Is everyone set? All right. Sorry so that took us so long, but. That's fine. Tag will assist. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Let me hand it off to the next. All right, so we're going to get started on our notebook today. Uh, my name's Nick. I'm a coordinator here, and let's get going. So we're going to be looking at the same IRIS data set today that we saw in our lecture, and we're going to be actually building these models and training them and seeing how we can make predictions on uh, some test data. So we're going to get started, and we're just going to... Oh, shit. We're, uh, we're just going to import our dependencies. So um, 
these are our common libraries that we use. Some familiar ones are like pandas, numpy, matplotlib. This lets us handle our data and uh, visualize it as well. And then sklearn. This library has all of our models kind of built out already in code. We just need to train them. So we saw a look at the Iris data set, and we have these three different classes. Um, we're trying to predict which class it is based off of some training parameters and whatnot. Um, fortunately, sklearn has this already built in. So we could just simply do a load Irish data set, and it really can't get any easier than that. And this line right here, that's our test train split. Basically what we're doing is fragmenting our data a little bit to make sure that we don't train on all of it. That way we can prevent overfitting and see if we can make true predictions based off of our models. So the first model we're going to make is random forest. Uh, we saw this basically. We have um, various numbers of decision trees, and they're each going to be voting on which class they think the prediction is. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, that is the number of trees that we have in our forest. So uh, this parameter you can tweak, and we can play around with see if. Maybe a higher or lower number will get us better predictions. So we're going to make that. Uh, we're going to call this function right here to get our model. And then we're going to fit it to our training data and training labels. Cool. And all the models that we see today, they're all supervised learning. So um, that's why we have our test train split. We have our x and our y. and um, we're going to see how well these can actually make predictions um, based off of the test data that we concealed from it. So one tool that we use for this is confusion matrix. And uh, let's see. So this fancy graph kind of tells us, um, it shows us the number of predictions it made accurately or not. So if it guesses um, the right class, it should be in kind of this diagonal line. And then if it's if the prediction's false, it's going to be like the prediction's going to be in a different category. So we'll be able to see exactly how many predictions it made right and how many predictions it made wrong, as well as which class it's predicting wrong. So we trained our model, and now we're going to throw in some of our test data and see how accurately it can make predictions. In this function right here, all we're doing is plotting our confusion matrix. So it looks like we got um, it looks like we got one wrong right here, um, which isn't too bad. Um, does everyone have that? Any questions on confusion matrixes? Yeah. What was the true label? So, oh yeah. So you can't really see that. Um, I think that's. So it was actually a, it was actually a Virginica, and it predicted a Versicolor. This bottom axis is wrong, but um, basically, yeah, these yeah these these labels are a little bit off, but um, you could kind of think of it as, um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So another metric that we can use to analyze how accurate or um, actually how correlated our predictions are to their actual true values is called the math to use correlation coefficient. So this number is going to give us a value from 0 to 1, basically telling us how correlated um, our predictions are to the true labels. Yeah? Uh, negative one. Oh, negative 1. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. So negative one to one. And basically, the closer to one we are, the more correlated our predictions are to the true value of each class. So we're going to go ahead and call that function and also print it. And we got 
0.89, which is fairly good. So like B plus, right, Cameron? So um, when you're talking about the Matthews correlation coefficient, is it like multiplying all this, like the data to like get it in that range? Is it like fitting it in, in the range of uh, negative one to one? Um, or like what is it actually like doing the coefficient? I'm actually not certain on that. Yeah, Brian? It's, it's, not, it's not fitting the data. It's, it's, a it's like a measure of accuracy. Yeah. So it's not an accuracy from zero to like 100, but like a percent. But it, it's um, the, are you talking about like how it actually, the math behind it, like calculate it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, the, I don't know the equation off the top of my head. Do you know? OK. So the main thing you guys want to take away from Matthew's <coughs> coefficient is that the, um, the size of the classes do, does not affect the overall Matthews coefficient, right? Because here, here's something to consider. Say we have 99.99% uh, .99 of one class and 0.001% of the other class. We will get 99.99% .99 accuracy if we just predict for this one class, right? Is that a good model? No. Matthews coefficient is a way for us to basically um, consider that. So when we make our models, all, we're not just forcing through like those very over, over the top answers. So it's a way for you guys to basically get a very accurate model that's irrelevant to the actual, well, not to get an uh, accurate model, a way to make sure you guys are getting that, an accurate model irrelevant to the size classes. Bueno? Yes. Okay. Yeah, basically. One size fits all. But yeah. Yeah. That's 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 a good kind of rule of thumb, I guess. Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. Be back to you. So is everyone good on that? Yeah. Alright, cool. Alright, so we're gonna look at our next kind of model. It's uh nearest neighbors. We kinda went over this uh pretty uh well in our lecture, but um basically what we're gonna do is try to see um, the distance between our data points and if we're trying to predict a new value, how close is it to um, that is that we trained on? And depending on how close it is, our model's gonna classify it a certain way, um, basically on a majority of the value and a vicinity that we're gonna define, which is our K variable. So um, yeah, this is also called KNN. So K is the number of neighbors that we're actually gonna look to. Yeah, so when k is 3, we look at the three closest neighbors, if we're trying to predict this red star. And then if k is 6, we're going to look at more neighbors, so like a broader region. And we're going to see, um, so in, in this first case, uh, our prediction would be it would be a blue class. And then the second one, because there's four yellow and two blue, it's going to be um, a yellow. And also, I linked a couple more articles that uh, dive deeper into this if you're interested. <coughs> so just to get started, we're going to visualize. Yeah, do you have a question? Basically, nearest neighbors can change as you add more. Yes. Into the mix. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but um, I, th I think interestingly, if it, get, if it gets larger or too large, it's not going to necessarily be better. Because as it expands and you're looking to more and more neighbors, you're going to lose some precision. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you remember from the presentation where we had the um, the two different stars, and when we increased the number of neighbors we looked at, it changed class. Yeah. That's what's going on there. So there's a certain threshold where you get better results and you get worse results after that. So it's a fine balancing act. And it depends on your data set. There's not a set number you need to find. It's something you need to figure out as you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One way, oh yeah, you have a question? Sorry. Um, is, so this number that we're trying to figure out, this is something that we, like it's like a dial that we change. And then it, considering like the results, if we see that they're, they're getting more and more accurate, like we're changing it based on that. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You could even program it in to maybe do like a for loop of different k values and then see, maybe do like a search to see which k values are going to work the best. Uh, one thing I think really helps to visualize this example, I think of it kind of like if you're having an election. So you have, um, you know, your local elections and then you have state elections. So if you look at um, local elections, like your electoral district, it's a lot smaller and it's also more precise. So people in, you know, one part of the city or another part might vote separately. And you could really determine that. So if you know someone lives in that zip code, you're probably going to be able to tell on the narrowness of the search which class they're going to fall in. But if you zoom out to a statewide, you don't know like what other cities are going on, and it's going to be a lot more general. So you can't really assume that you know everyone in one state is going to vote a certain way. It's going to be it needs to be a little bit more narrow to get some um, real accuracy on it. Yeah, but it really depends on your data set, how many neighbors actually exist. You know. So just to give you guys um, a good visualization, we're going to go ahead and plot some of our data. So you could, you can really see how it clumps together. And there's some overlap. We talked about that in our lecture. Um, I believe it's the Versicolor and Virginica that overlap. Yes. Yeah. Um, but even then, you could kind of see that they're um, a little bit still defined, uh, even though they overlap a bit. Um, all right, let's get started. We're going to make our model and fit it. Cool. And do you see how fast that is? Like, um, it's not really like a neural network where you have to train it overnight and your house is like 10 degrees warmer. <laughs> it, in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so let's see how we're going to make some predictions and then we're going to compare them to the true value um, of what those classes actually were. So it looks like we got 100% accuracy, which is pretty good. So it seems like this model, um, or at least the way that we made it, is performing better than our random force. And let's go ahead and print out, or actually uh, graph our predictions. So you can see that the predictions that it made kind of follow a similar pattern to uh, what our tests or our training data looked like. Is everyone good on that? Yeah, cool. Can you repeat that? Okay, so um, these are our predictions. And you can see that, well, it's kind of hard for you to see because um, of the color. Okay. Yeah, but um, <laughs> our predictions kind of form in clusters, just like our training data. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Do you understand like the mechanics, how we're making the predictions? Uh, what are you talking about? So how we like derive our predictions? It's from uh, like the examples, the neighbors that we look at. So if we're looking at a value that's here, for example, we're actually going to be comparing it to like our training data, which would be on this on this graph. Okay. So we can tell it's similar in that respect. So we're going to go ahead and classify it like that. Okay. Yep. So your predictions, did they specifically plot like what type of flower is going to be where on your graph? Or like what is yes. what the prediction plot? So um, what our prediction does, or how our predictions are made, it looks at the examples that we already saw and knows which uh, class those are in. And we're actually going to be looking at like the distance. So like you could kind of think of it like Cartesian distance from it. And we're going to be looking at um, a specific number of the nearest neighbors in that. So if, um, our, if our testing point falls in a certain neighborhood, we're going to look to this, the closest neighbors and see their class. And whichever class has like a majority, we're just going to go ahead and predict it like that. So the point is like the actual prediction based on the, the like the Oh, the concept. point? Yeah. The okay, point. so so the color is the prediction. Oh, okay. The point is like 
it's you know the length of the pedal or whatever. It's all the different. Um, it's like our X, our X classes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you just repeat the difference between the four um, diagrams again? Yeah. So uh, if we. Um, the prediction one. Okay. So the prediction, just which what each of these graphs are. These are simply just our classes, so um, we could probably go ahead and describe our data. So um, let's do this. So all I'm really doing is I'm juxtaposing each of the columns to each other, just so we can look at where, um, basically where these are clumping together. So like what um, pattern formations that they're making. It's not really, I mean, we could uh, take a look at the labels. So maybe, you know, the pedal length as that increases, the pedal width also increases. Those are these kind of uh, qualitative categories. Is that what it is, like the X and the Y? Or yeah. Well, the well the x is like I'm. If you look at the code right here, so um, all I'm doing is I'm plotting like one column against another column. Yeah. Yeah. And then just one more time, the color is the prediction, not uh, where it lies on the graph. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our next model, which are SVMs. And we're actually going to make three of these models uh, based on what we saw in the lecture. So we have our linear. We have our uh, RBF, which is kind of like a radial. And we have our polynomial. And this is just like a fancy one-liner, so we can train each of our models in a, in a loop. Wow. Yeah. Stupid. Now we're just going to go ahead and make predictions on each of these models. And uh, maybe we'll see if one performs better than the other. So these are our confusion matrices. And it looks like each of them performed. This one got one wrong. And the first two were perfect. So it looks like, um, I think it's RBF. That one made a misstep. But we'll see um, each of the correlation coefficients for that. Yeah, so actually. Um, it looks like linear and polynomial were perfect in this test case. And then RBF got uh, one wrong. So that's interesting, because uh, you were saying that RBF technically performs the best. But maybe it's just like a, we're testing on it. I got all perfect. Yeah. 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 Everyone's results going to be a bit different. So this, this wasn't perfect. And I'm sad that it wasn't perfect. <laughs> yeah. But overall, when it, uh, overall, RBF seems to do the best compared to all the different kernels out there. Yeah. So don't be discouraged. Yeah. And you can tell, like, we're testing on a very small set. Yeah. So I think there's only, like, 10 values in there. So if we wanted to, we could maybe get more data and see, like, how it looks on 1,000 or 100,000. Yeah, so um, our, yeah, our rows, so like, um, yeah, it probably would take longer. But it would still be like very fast compared to other methods. Uh, it, it would take longer, but it's minuscule. Mm -hmm. Like, you really won't notice the difference in training time. Yeah. Yeah.
So we're going to be looking at a different data set now. This one is credit card fraud. Basically, a lot of companies have, um, they literally have task force to try to tackle fraud and ide identify it and, you know, uh, stop transactions or people from stealing money or um, making false purchases and canceling them and all this. So it's a really big issue, especially at companies like PayPal or Amazon. Um, and billions and billions of dollars go into trying to stop these people. So we're going to be looking at a data set that uh, has a lot of transactional data. But uh, interestingly, a lot of these columns are masked. So let's see what the data set looks like. Huh. Oops. Here, I forgot to run this. My bad. Alrighty. So we have all these different, uh, all these different columns, but it's like V1, V2 to V28. So basically, all that means is that this could be sensitive data, like someone's location, or um, maybe what computer someone's on, or like their keystrokes. Who knows? Um, yeah, who knows like when you go to check out something like what they're trying to collect on you to identify. Maybe if it's a robot, you know, it's going to have unusual behavior or all sorts of things. But what we do know is which time it's at um, and also the amounts it is and whether or not it was a fraudulent transaction or not. So the way that time is considered in this data set is all these transactions were taking over a 40-hour period. So essentially, the time is just a timestamp. So it can't really reveal us how long the transaction took, but it could tell us like the time of day it was at. Are there any questions on this? Yeah. Um, I believe that might just be number of trans, like which transaction it is. Do you know? Well, I think that's just numbering. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just kind of like a numbering thing. Yeah. And it's just it's just kind of like some metadata. Yeah. So it's not going to be really useful for making a model. It's just kind of there to be there. Yeah. So uh, one thing that's tricky with this data set is that a very, very small percentage of these transactions are actually fraudulent. So trying to figure out whether a uh, transaction is fraudulent or not, it's kind of like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I think it's um, yeah, 0.1727%, which is like nothing, right? Um, so like, how are we going to go about identifying these when we have so few test cases? Um, this is where you guys are going to start uh, going ahead and trying to build out a solution to this problem on your own. And I encourage you to try to get an answer going and submit it to our, um, our uh, competition that we have. OK, OK. So yeah, um, my bad. Uh, we're, we're just going to load in this data and clean it up and split it. And um, yeah, right here, you're going to try to implement a model. And then you're going to try to see how it performs. Uh, feel free to like refer back to the code that was earlier in the notebook and see um, how we made our different models and how we trained them. It should just be like one or two lines. And then um, I would encourage you to maybe plot some uh, confusion matrices or, yeah? Make sure to remove that. Oh yeah, and that's where you want to put your code. this year we'll just yell at you if you don't code anything. And also let us know if you need any help or if you have any coding questions.
Uh, you can run the code at the bottom, and I'll walk you. I'll walk everyone through to how to submit it again. To the, to the competition. Oh, yeah. uh, refer back to earlier in the, work, in the notebook oh. for how to do it. And if you need any help, just raise your hand and we'll walk around and help you out. Um, you see how a lot of people are oh, yeah. okay, So there is some pattern to the data. Um, it's just really hard to try. The other ones are the Yeah. Okay. All the other ones are the yeah. Oh yeah, my friend has a test for that. Um, the first test is pretty easy though. I got most of the lecture. Um, but actually, is this like a... So, yeah, here, there, here's an example up here for... Uh, Supervised, right? We're supervising it because we're doing what it is. For for creating a uh, K near his neighbor's so test. The okay, supervised so. learning part of it is actually all that means is that we have um, labels to our data uh, and we're fitting okay, so the, basically we're fitting in the X and the Y okay. and trying to find some sort of rule set that helps all right, us make so it. So um, the K or like the N that we can choose that's like kind of. Just playing around, seeing what works the best. Okay. Yeah. That that is like a tuning knob on it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I was late. No, no problem. Glad you came up. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Uh, remember a feedback form. Please give us your feedback. I shall keep saying this. Please, uh, ucfai.org forward slash feedback. We'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, how we did today, on uh, from both Nick and Jarvis. So. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna code something up up here. I'll do something. I'm actually curious how the K nearest neighbors is gonna work, so let's just say. It's pretty bad. Alright, so let's, so, so I'm gonna try something up here. I'm gonna try K nearest neighbors, see what happens. Uh, and. So let's run that and train this. All right, so it took one second to decade nearest neighbors. Pretty good. All right. So let's let's get some predictions. So let's see if I can spell this right first try. <laughs> Matthews. Core. Oh, there's no way I can do this. I'm gonna butcher it. Uh, well, that's okay. I'm gonna go copy pasta. Uh, let's see. Uh, where are you? Uh, I would like my correlation coefficient. Uh, I believe it's just what it sounds like, but with underscores in between and all. Right. Okay, so how far was I off? Because I can't find it. C, F. Instead of F, F, you just put like C, F. C, F? Am I right on that? Uh, or C O R R I yeah. C O E F. C O E F. That's it? And then oh, there's two parameters. Yeah, so there's uh so we're gonna put in our our predictions. So let's get our predictions. The pr prediction's gonna be um, uh, we're gonna take our model dot predict. We're gonna predict on our testing data. And we're going to put in our predictions and our Y test. All right, so K near, five nearest neighbors, I got 0 0.2. So mm, it's pretty nice. bad. Yeah. But see, if I were to do accuracy, it would have been probably close almost to 100%. So the correlates, as you can see, the coefficient could tell us really, you know, a really good indicator that we're really bad. <laughs> so do you have a question? Right. Uh, okay, so you know, in our so in our data set, we only have out of like almost three hundred thousand examples, we only have about five hundred uh, cases of actual fraud. So most, of, so we have like say like two hundred and ninety nine thousand of zero class. So our class is zero, and then only a couple, you know, five hundred that are one. So it's because of that. If we take all of our data, and we just said always predict zero. If we always predicted zero, what would our accuracy be? So if so, if I if I were to um, always predict zero on all the data points in this data set, what would my accuracy be? It would be like ninety nine. 
It'll be it'll be like ninety nine point like nine nine nine. Like it'll be like really high. So is that a good model though? Like are we doing it? My mod it's not even a model, I say return zero. Boom. I, <laughs> I predict it. So but the correlation coefficient is saying, yeah, you're doing really bad, point you know, point two, you're not really close to one there. So you're you're very close to zero, which means there's just no correlation at all. So and the correlation coefficient means like negative one is a negative correlation. So you're like doing like even worse, <laughs> like you're going like backwards. So you're like you're it's like a negative correlation. Um, and then close to one is a positive correlation, that's what we're trying to hit. That's that means our, our points are close together. And zero means it's this we're not doing well. So Well, you want as close to one as possible. So like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you know, that's pretty good. Yeah, so somewhere around there. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, K nearest neighbors. Actually, let me try. Let me try one K nearest neighbor. Oh, you're trying to implement the accuracy function. Uh, oh, to, to test the accuracy? Yeah. It's, gotta, it's hard to read those. Oh. Yeah. Um, Just using. Okay. Think of like a Key wrong. error zero, because it, it's not. It's like oh, you're getting key error zero too. Yeah, because it, it's not. I don't think you can. You can sub. You can. Yeah, reference. It. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah. But exactly. You should be able to. Actually, where's the key error if predictions i equals yeah, zero? Hmm, I don't know. Is that how it was done before? May yeah. watch will magically work now. I don't know. All right. Yeah, so, so but your accuracy would be like 99%. I don't worry about that right now. Um, I wanted to print, oh, I yeah. want to try a different model. Yeah, so because there's so many, like, um, transactions that aren't fraudulent, it's really easy to predict that. All right, so I know a lot of you guys were thinking SVMs might be the way to go here. So let's just take, uh, let's try RBF. Does that, does that See how this works. Um, so you can just guess. All right. So what's what's so nice about SK Learn is that we don't even really need to do much. We just replace that and boom. All right. So we got C equals C. So we'll, 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 we'll let's do. What are other good Jarvis? What are other good C values for the regularization parameter? Uh, I think he needs help there. Sir? Do you know? Okay. So we'll just keep it at one point now. Huh? All right. I'm just gonna put this cell down here too, so we can just. Do this all in one shot. All right, so let's see. RBF, here we go. All right, so we're going to train an RBF. See, now these take a few seconds to train because we got almost 300,000 data points we're training on. Or it's more like 250, I think. These will take a second to train. Come on. You also only, Kaggle doesn't really give you that many, that much CPU power either, so. Yeah. If you were to do this on your home computer, it'd definitely be a lot faster than what you're getting here, but. Yeah. It's free, so, can't explain. Okay. All right, so we'll give that second to train. Uh, yeah. Jesus. It, it will stop running. It's just Kaggle is just slow. So. And we're training a lot of data on this, so sadly it's just not that nice. Yeah, give it a hot second. Well, neural networks you're usually talking about models with like billions, like you know, uh, like like hundreds of millions of parameters. So they have to like train and stuff, so those take a long time to train because the models are so big. But these are all very, very small models, so you can train them very quickly on very little research. Obviously this one's a little bit longer because we're using an online service, so it's a little bit, it'll provide us the best of resources, but it should be done in at least like, probably like two or three minutes to take. So. Has anybody else gotten any, anything? Any, what did you get? Oh, that's really good. Correlations coefficient. 
Oh, what, what did he, what did he use? Oh, so we got a random force that got a 0.91 uh, Matthews uh, correlation coefficient. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'll go over how to submit that to the competition. So it looks like it might be random force might be the way to go. Yeah. Why, are you, why are you changing my <laughs> well, what's going on? I was just, I was just playing around with it. Uh, yeah. Oh, if you want, I can do it below. I want to see if it finished. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't run anything. No, not that. Not that. Okay, okay. No, it's still running. Oh, okay. Yeah, I won't touch it. I won't touch it. Yeah, my bad. I, I didn't see that it was running. Yeah, yeah. it's fine. Um, yeah, so we got 0.91 as a random force. How many estimators did you have? 25 estimators. Nice. We're going for 100 now, but it's taking a minute. Yeah, it's going to probably take a few minutes. When I was testing this on Kaggle, it took a couple minutes for a big random force. So. Yeah, it, it's just a large data set. So. And Kaggle doesn't give us good resources. Um, but yeah, so where you, did anybody else? Did you guys get anything? Or are you still training? Who hasn't got something to train yet? I think it's everybody's taking a few minutes to train now. So it's not like K nearest neighbors, well, it's just instant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this K nearest neighbors doesn't actually like train. It's just looking at your ground truth and looking at it. There's no training to it's been a bunch of nearest neighbors. neighbors. It's just plotting data and seeing how it works. Yeah, it seems like it's taking yeah. a while. Yeah, it's just taking a while. I mean, we still got 20 minutes here, so uh, wait, I want to submit the competition before you guys are going here. If you guys are going. All right. Yeah. Right. It should. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, so if you want, so to submit to the competition, once you're done training your model, uh, all you got to do is, so this cell down here will we'll run it. Um, so remember when you're doing, um, we'll create your submission file for you. So make sure your model is named model, otherwise the submission won't work. You guys hear me? Uh, make sure when you name your model up here, make sure to name it model. Otherwise, the submission won't work. So just name your variable model. Um, but remember, so to submit, I'm going to click the commit. Um, so this is still taking forever here. Wait, that's not right. Random force. Oh, yeah. I mean, you would have to import everything. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna comment this out actually, so we can. It's gonna use K nearest neighbor. Oh. I want to get the K nearest neighbor before. There we go. All right, so to submit to our competition, um, what we're going to do is we're going to click a commit up here. So we'll commit our notebook. So it's going to run through your notebook. It's, pro it, it's actually, when you commit, it runs through your entire notebook. So, this, so if you have a large model, this may take like five or six minutes because it's going to train your model and do everything. So I commented my thing out, so it'll go quickly, so I'm going to show you. All right, so it's committing. So we're just going to give this a second. What'd you get? I don't know. Ah. All, right. All right, so once we finish, um, once we finish committing up here, uh, we're going to select, um, we're going to select open version. And this will open, this is our fully finished comp committed notebook, good to go. Uh, you're going to scroll down here on the side to output, and then you just click submit the competition right here. And once you submit, it's going to submit to the competition, and we can see, you know, see how you compare to other people. What was that? Yeah, he's got to finish committing, yeah.